To Locked On Knicks, Alex Wolf and Gavin Shaw here, and we are breaking down the Knicks 130 to 106 absolute drubbing of the Pistons on Friday night. Gavin, what are we getting into in this one? We're talking the bench is back, Emmanuel quickly going off, Derek Rose looking great, and just the young core in general having a big bounce back game. RJ Barrett, OB Toppin. Uh, and we'll talk about the pace, and we'll just talk about the utter dominance. So th this was an easy one for the Knicks. They made it look good, and we get into it now on Locked on Knicks. You are Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome into Locked on Knicks. We want to thank you guys. For making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day, whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube, we appreciate you guys making us part of your daily routine. I am Alex Wolf. I'm editor in chief of Knicks site, The Strickland, which you can find at thestrick.land. He is Gavin Shaw, your favorite play by play broadcaster's favorite play by play broadcaster. And we are breaking down the Knicks 130 to 106 decimation, destruction embarrassment <laughs> whatever you want to call it of the Detroit Pistons a heck of a bounce back game after that first game Gavin I felt like they really took a lot of the things that worked well for them in that first game uh and brought it over to this as, such as pushing the pace and and uh you know really making sure to take advantage of whatever you know advantages they could create uh but also it certainly didn't hurt things that the young core namely Emmanuel quickly R.J. Barrett, uh, Obi Toppin, who we'll probably get to more in the second segment, but all these guys bounced back and had huge games, the three of them. Yeah, I I think I want to – it sounds weird because I, I feel like we're, we're back in preseason. I want to put a caveat on all this that the Pistons – had one of the worst defensive games I've ever seen from an NBA team. It's they're, they're super young. They're, they're playing two rookies pretty consistently. It makes sense, but man, oh man, were they atrocious. That being said, the Knicks did everything possible to take advantage of it. And I thought that started early with RJ Barrett and, and just how focused he was on facilitating it. And, and, and that, I mean, we, we always talk about this with him, but I thought that showed some real maturity. A lot of guys would be pressing and they're like, oh crap, I got to justify that contract. I got to come out. I got to have a good game after last game. And, and RJ was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just going to make the right play over and over and over again. And it started early, like when, when he attacked baseline and just, just made the simple pass out to Evan Fournier for three, um, had, had that smooth hook lob to Mitchell Robinson in the pick and roll. Those two have, have gotten to a point of just, just having fantastic chemistry now. Um, the no look to Julius Randle was, was, for my money, the pass of the game for him where he, he kind of just lulled the defense to sleep and then just slipped in a, a bullet to Randle. And we, we can get into this more later, but Again, Randall doing his best Obi Toppin impression. He was only open because he just sprinted down the floor as hard as humanly possible. And then it was a little bit more analogous to what we saw in the precinct from him as a finisher, where he was going into the body, centered at the rim. And I think him having his steps and having his timing down is so important at the basket. You saw against Memphis where things started really going wrong, Alex. I thought he was just going a little bit too fast and he was clearly pressing. Not only was he taking what was available in this game, but he was doing it at his own pace. And, and, and then at the basket, he let himself get composed by at times letting the defender jump first and then going up and finishing. And it, it led to a couple of and ones back to back ones in the third quarter. I, I just thought this was such a composed game from RJ Barrett. Yeah, I thought so too. He did exactly what he had to do, right? Like he didn't, he didn't press, which was the most important thing. I mean, the first thing, too, obviously, is he made layups. Like, <laughs> one yeah. of the main reasons that, that the game the other day was such a disaster was that he generated a number of pretty easy opportunities for himself and then just blew it. I mean, there's no better way to put it for how that first game went. And it was just, you know, if, if he makes, like, four more layups, the Knicks win that game. Um, but, you know, he didn't, and so they didn't win it. But, you know, it's it, – he – played within himself, you know, the working on facilitating early, I thought was really important too. And, you know, there are those three passes you mentioned. I also loved, I mean, simple thing, but you know, he just ran a really nice little side pick and roll with Isaiah Hartenstein and made just a picture perfect pass. And like, I think that sort of thing gets RJ going, you know, I, I think that the Knicks should look more often to get him involved in facilitating early because that seems to have like a, 
Like for some guys, I, I feel like they have to get their scoring going first and then the facilitating comes along. For RJ, I think it's sort of the opposite. Like I think we've seen at times in his career where like if you get him facilitating first, it sort of like gets him into the flow of the game. And then that allows the shots to come easier for him because then teams will be like, oh, I'm worried about this role man or I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. And, you know, then RJ gets these opportunities that he can take advantage of. Um, and of course that, you know, that, that pick and roll that I'm mentioning with Hartenstein, again, they were preying on, I mean, for all the belly aching over Jalen Duran <laughs> that some people did when the Knicks didn't take him. And I mean, I was one of them that day, like being like, I didn't necessarily want Duran. I was more a fan of like, you know, an AJ Griffin or something, but you know, Duran's very raw. Uh, like he got exposed a lot in this game for the fact that like, he just doesn't understand how to read NBA coverages yet, which is fine. Cause he's like 18 years old, but um, yeah, it was uh, just a phenomenal game from RJ. Basically, like I said, that nothing spectacular, but that was fine because all he really had to do was just kind of get back to basics, play a game within himself and not, over compensate for how bad the first game was and try to like hijack it all. But RJ, as we've seen over his whole career, just isn't really a hijack type of player. Generally he's, he's usually a, a game flow sort of guy. So uh, in the end, I, I thought that it was a fantastic game for him, mostly just because of how well he played within himself, but the same could probably be said for Emmanuel quickly as well. Yeah, he was, look, look, he, he, he was awesome in this one and he, he really needed it after not hitting a field goal. In the first game, uh, bounced back in a big way, 8 of 14 from the field, 3 for 8 for 3, 20 points, 7 rebounds, 7 assists. In 27 minutes was a plus 27 in those minutes, a team high. And it was it was representative, I thought, that plus minus of the performance that we all got to watch him have in this game. And it was very similar to RJ in that it was patience. I mean, honestly, the play that – might have stood out to me the most was perhaps his his like most innocuous he had the ball at the top of the arc it was actually the left side of the arc um in the first quarter and this was something our our friend um ariel pacheco pointed out on twitter but iq at times when he struggled in his career has had a tendency just to pick up his dribble too early and get trapped and, and especially on a second unit without a ton of secondary ball handling that's killed a lot of possessions and that was a big theme with him in the preseason this time he was just dribbling it around the arc drew two defenders but the big thing was he kept his dribble going and he let Obi complete a cut to the basket which drew Derek Rose's defender away from him in the left corner and then Obi it, it was just like a like a chess master out out there a young young Ron, we Ron Weasley playing human chess uh, just flipped it cross court to Derek Rose in the opposite corner and, and, and Rose nailed the three that got Rose going. Rose went on to make three in a row. Uh, the Knicks were up by 10 and they, they were rolling. It was, it was never really a close game from that point forward. Um, and, and then just the shot making from IQ, right? Um, nailing catch and shoot threes, which last year again was a big issue for him. He was much better at off the dribble threes than catch and shoot threes a year ago. I'm um, him and Brunson having nice chemistry. It was great to see them get a couple minutes on the court. Where, where it was just a very simple play where Brunson drove, kicked it to IQ, uh, IQ's defender was closing out because he was helping on JB. And then IQ just pumped, blew right by him, got an easy layup. And then the last thing I'll point out, Alex, was was the mid-range game for Emmanuel quickly. That, that, that's always been our question. When is that going to come along? Had a, had a pretty nasty, like, across the lane fadeaway over Jalen Duran, and, and then in the fourth quarter, um, made a baseline jumper, just just coming off a screen on an out-of-bounds play. And and just, just simple stuff like that that allows him to flash his shot-making talent is is really exciting and I, and I like that Tibbs is actively drawing stuff up to get him shots from two because he should be hyper efficient just with how good his touch is on those kind of looks yeah I'm with you and uh, you know I, I think my my main thing with quickly in this game well first off you know we talked about in the in the or I specifically said in the last game that it, it was more in reference to RJ but it sort of applied to quickly too of Last game, it got so bad between those two that anytime either of them touched the ball, I started going like, no, 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 don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. And this one, with quickly, I was worried, you know, he misses his first attempt. And, like, I I don't want to be reactionary, but, like, you know, I'm like, oh, God, I hope this, I hope this isn't going to be one of those, like, really rough opening season stretches for him again, like he and RJ tend to have. And then he hit that second one. And that, you know, his first field goal of the season. 
And from that moment forward, I was just like, no, this feels right today. And like, it was, he, he played so fantastic. Like it just looked like he was way less in his head. Uh, as Clyde always says, you know, like if you're, if you're thinking about your shot rather than just taking the shot, it's going to make it go in a lot less. He was clearly thinking about his shots a lot in the first game, at least to my eye in this game. Not so much. I thought that he was, I thought that he was playing more within himself and, you know, really just taking what was given to him. But to your point too, also taking charge a little more as far as, you know, not picking up his dribble, not, you know, I, I guess, I don't know how best to put it. Like not playing tame, I guess, you know, yeah, like he was dictating being, instead of being dictated to it, exactly. Like he was being aggressive, even with Brunson and even with Rose on the floor with him, he was still dictating the action a lot. Like he ran a nice, like Nash dribble at one point too. In addition yeah. to the to the you know the dribble around the perimeter that you're mentioning, like he just seemed much more concerned with dictating the action in this game, which I think is the real key for him. And actually brings me to a point that I think that we can address in our second segment. We've talked about this before, but should Emmanuel quickly be the starting shooting guard on this team? Because I really loved his minutes with Brunson and what he was able to bring to the floor there. But we'll get to that in just a second. But first, I got to let you guys know about Prize Picks. And Prize Picks is the most fun daily fantasy game out there. And honestly, in, uh, for my money, the easiest one to win out there because of the way that their fantastic format works. For example, you could, you could take Luka Doncic to score more than 26.5 points, LeBron James to have more than 7.5 rebounds, Kevin Durant to have less than 6.5 assists, and Steph Curry to have more than 3.5 three three-pointers made in a single night and guess what you're not playing against a bunch of professionals with their spreadsheets and their you know million entries to flood the entry pools like in some of those other daily fantasy games it's just you versus the odds and if you win it, you get money it's that simple with prize picks you pick two to five players and if they go and score more or less than their prize pick projection you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people, just you versus the projections. And they offer projections on any sport that you watch, including NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men's college basketball, women's college basketball, soccer, WNBA, esports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Euro basketball, cricket, and more. Somehow more. Uh, entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It really is that easy. And you can even do mixed sport entries. Say if you wanted to maybe you're a huge New York sports fan and you want to do like a, a combo entry that includes the Jets, the Giants, the Knicks, and the Rangers on a single night. Uh, we won't include that other team that's only a fake New York team that plays our same sport. But you can make that entry and you know ha have all of your rooting interests involved in a single entry. It's pretty cool. So download PrizePix or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. And if you deposit $100, prize picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, prize picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. All right, and we're back to get into our second segment here. And we are talking Emmanuel quickly. And Gavin, I'll just pose the question to you that, that I posed at the end of the last segment. Should he start at shooting guard at this point? I mean, I think that one constant in these first two games is that Evan Fournier has been pretty underwhelming on both ends, which is kind of disappointing because I, I thought he was really starting to find a groove towards the end of preseason. But Emmanuel quickly, especially in this game, I mean, he looked great with Brunson and he looked great with Rose. Rose just kind of looked amazing in general. But like quickly really sort of bridges the gap between those two, I feel like in a very nice way where – he keeps the defensive intensity up. He keeps the ball moving. He can initiate. And we've seen that like both Brunson and Rose are very elite at being catch and shoot three point shooters at this point in their career as well. It almost makes too much sense to me to just start quickly at the two at this point. Yeah, I think I'm I'm ultimately still team Quentin Grimes, but that that's it's a very big if. Like where where his health is at, what's going on with his foot? Like the the longer this lingers, I mean, maybe that's worth a full podcast in itself. I, I at least I know on my end, the more concerned I get, and the more I'm like, what do we don't, what do we not know here? Like, is this going to come out like all of a sudden? Like, oh wait, this is actually like a eight week thing, like instead of like a two day thing. But g given the current structure of their roster, yeah, I'm I'm with you just because he gives a little bit more creation, and and I want to give um, Evan some credit 
because I, I think early this year, um, very early, obviously two games, but also going into preseason, we've seen he's less um, reticent to attack gaps than he was early last year, where I think last year he was he, he came in and, and to his detriment after that amazing opening game against the Celtics, he was really trying not to step on anyone's toes. And he was like, and, and I think maybe some of this was on Tibbs saying like, hey, we, we had this role with Reggie Bullock that really worked out last year where he was basically just a catch and shoot guy. Um, I, I think you could be amazing doing that. And Evan kind of took that to heart and, and it limited his game. And this year, I think he's he's pushing to expand and to get to the rim more. And, and, and this game against the Pistons, he did a good job of that, had one really nice layup in the fourth quarter. And then I can't remember if it was in the first or second, but had one where he missed, but Mitch got an easy put back on it. I say all that to say that Emmanuel quickly is just better at those things than Evan Fournier. Like, like he's 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 faster uh, getting to the basket. He's more creative around the rim. He's a better passer, uh, kicking it back out to the perimeter. Um, slightly better shooter off the dribble, just in that he can get to a shot a little bit easier than Fournier can in one-on-one -on -one situations. And, and then defensively, there's just no comparison between the two. If Even if quickly is a step down from Grimes, he's certainly better than Fournier despite giving up three or four inches uh, to our favorite Frenchman. Uh, he, he brings a better option on that end with his length and his activity. So I don't necessarily disagree with you. I, I think the only thing to see there would be if Fournier has the same chemistry on the bench with Rose and Toppin, because the way Obi and quickly amplify each other, I, I, I would just be a little hesitant to lose that, especially if Grimes is available as an option. Yeah. I, well, that's sort of where I feel like I think Fournier would be all right there. You know what I mean? Because, I think that he has done a good job throughout last year and like even preseason this year of being, if nothing else, one of the best guys at feeding the Knicks big men, you know, like just understanding how to make the right pass to make sure that the bigs get their touches down deep. And like Obi isn't necessarily that guy that's going to be like sealing off his man. Like the, the person that I always, you know, look at as the best example of Fournier passing to a big man is Sims last year. I felt like they had, you know, Sims and Fournier just had this great chemistry where Sims would seal off his man and Fournier was great at putting it in just the right spot where it was like just high enough of a pass to eclipse the, uh, or, you know, the, to clear over the, the, you know, the defender's hand, but then, you know, enough to not sail over Jericho Sims and, you know, just let him go up and get a nice easy layup. Could he do that with OB too? It might be worth experimenting, you know? I don't know. I, I do think setting the defensive tone is going to be important for the Knicks, especially against better teams. I mean, even in this game, they didn't really start heavily pulling away until the bench started getting in. Uh, and that was largely because the offense was playing really well, but the defense wasn't really holding up. Uh, and there was a number of times where Fournier got kind of cooked on the perimeter and, you know that's not pretty, you know, that that's the sort of stuff that can early on, like sort of sink your momentum as you're trying to build like an early lead, which as we've seen for the Knicks over the last couple of years, they're not great at building early leads. You know, they're more of a fall behind early, especially last year and then come back sort of team. Uh, it would be nice to just kind of cover both those bases and, you know, be able to uh, uh, throw a better defender out there to start, and run in transition more. And again, like quickly amplifies Obi. And I agree with that, but with Randall playing how he is, as we've noted, he's been running out in transition and everything. Do you need like, is it, is it going to hurt quickly? Like it did like last year, say where Randall would, you know, just slowly bring the ball up the court and then quickly would be forced to just kind of be, you know, an off ball guy running around, you know, trying to find an open spot up shot this time around now they're all running together and it seems like they're trusting the board. As you said, they're trusting the <laughs> preseason board and, you know, actually enacting the the pace stuff that, that was asked of them. And so I think there's no better way to make sure that that keeps happening than to put another player out there in the starting lineup that seems really interested in running the floor and Emmanuel quickly, who can handle the ball himself and create, but can also, you know, spot up similar to Jalen Brunson, where then you have two guys in your two starting guard spots that have very similar skill sets, but quickly definitely brings really good defensive intensity and, and could at the very least, I think put up a better fight against say like 
if we're going back to the first matchup, like a John ja Morant early in a game to try to, you know, keep him contained enough that you can sort of build something early on and not get like demoralized by a guy like John ja Morant going for 15 points, you know, in the first like quarter or whatever. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's a great point, like particularly on Randall, because we see how often I, I know we we're going to get into Obi and, and we can in a second, but we see how often Randall is just generating open threes, like for RJ Barrett in particular. And that if there's anything the bench unit lacks in terms of accommodating quickly, it's just getting him easy opportunities for catch and shoot threes. And and look, that that was true the first night of the season. It certainly wasn't true the second night of the season because Derek Rose set him up for, for one where he had basically 10 feet of space. We know what kind of passer OB is. We know what kind of passer Hartenstein is. But Randall, at this point, along with RJ, are, are still the two best guys on the team at like just getting into the heart of the defense, drawing two defenders. I mean, Brunson as well. So the opportunity for IQ to really develop as a catch and shoot guy. I mean, the whole question for him this year, I noted it earlier real quick, but it, it's can he hit close to 40% of his relatively open catch and shoot threes? Because last year he was at 32% on catch and shoot threes, which doesn't really make sense for a guy who has the shooting talent that we know he has. But we spent a ton of time on him. Um, let's let's talk Obi Toppin uh, real quick because it was it was a bounce back game for him as well. 7 and 12 from the field, 2 of 5 from 3, 16 points. Four boards, three assists. Alex, what, what stood out to you um, in his performance? It's sort of just the the stuff that always stands out with Obi, right? You know, at, at his best, he's he is like the the spark plug that lights the the gunpowder or whatever, like in transition. I mean, he just he's always in the right spot. You know, he generates easy assists for his teammates, which is looks nice on a stat sheet, but also you know just functionally, it's like he keeps the opposing defense always having to worry about, wait, is Obi Toppin already at the basket right now? Which then, you know, can scramble a transition defense. Even if Obi isn't at the basket, they're game planning for that sort of thing already. And then, you know, if Obi starts running, then they have to go, oh, crap. And everybody panics and tries to close in on Obi, which can then open up a, you know, a corner three for somebody or, you know, what have you. He, he just really, you know, I know that some people, especially when he has bad games, will be like, see, he's just a leak out and dunk guy. But even if that was all he is, which it's not, like, that's so valuable. The fact that he is so smart about when to leak out, like, he's always smart about, okay, my teammate has a chance at the rebound here, so I'm not going, or so I am going to leak out. But if he's needed with help rebounding, he's almost always in the right place to at least go up and attempt to get a rebound you know, on the defensive end as well. So, you know, it's not like he's leaking out and and just completely tanking any chance the team has of getting a rebound or whatever. He's only doing it if he's, like, fairly certain that his team already has the rebound. Um, and then on top of that, like, he, he wasn't just leaking out in transition in this game either. He was making threes and just being an all-in-all -all awesome offensive player, which is him at his best. I mean, I thought this game was really... Like, between him and Randall, this is probably one of the best games I think that they've played in tandem, like, ever. Um, which, again, I, I won't beat the dead horse too much, but it's still disappointing that we don't get to see them together ever. Because I thought that this game, they would have had a grand old time running in transition together. Uh, you know, bending a defense to their will that way, where both of them displayed the ability to get to the hoop in transition and, uh, you know, just generally keep the defense on their toes the whole time. I mean, can you imagine a world where it, we have a possession like where RJ came down and fed Randall with that nice look, but let's say that the defense rotated to Randall. And so he's like, oh no. But then, oh wait, Obi Toppin's also streaking in there from the corner. And, you know, Randall with his vision can just kind of sneak a quick pass in there. And then boom, Obi's got either an alley-oop or, you know, a quick pass to a dunk, whatever the case may be. There's real potential with that lineup, I think. And, and, you know, I'd love to see it at some point, but for Obi, for me, it just comes down to, he, he is the, you know, he stirs the drink as far as transition is, is concerned. And he really did that in this game and, and was just elite at it as he always is. Yeah. Um, I'm in total agreement. And, and the shot uh, after he had as this, this, this was an all time uh, Clyde style UFO, on his opening shot of the game where it was the classic uh, air ball, but also somehow off to the side by like four or five feet. 
Um, but then he, he looked really smooth on the other two threes that he hit. Also had a nice mid-range jumper. And I don't know about you, but it was it was almost like nostalgic for me watching Rose just spoon feed him for one. Like it it was it was like the like the classic like sequel movie. Uh, like, like, like whether it's a Creed or a Rocky where like the fighter loses his way and has to go back to his old trainer. It's like, all right, we got to We got to start from the bottom up, build you up from the basics. And like, he just, he just gave Obi like a 10 footer. And then from that point on, Obi, Obi was confident. So it was, it was nice again to have like Rose back with those guys. And I want to talk about Rose's performance in particular, Alex, but let, let, let's take our second break. Come right back into Derek Rose a little bit. All right, guys, we are back on Locked On Knicks. Uh, let's let's talk Derek Rose because I, I thought he was he was fantastic in this one, um, which was good because, uh, like you, again, overreaction to a small sample size. But I was a tiny bit worried about Rose after the first game. Where he was really inefficient and had a lot of trouble generating room. No such issues in this game. 16 minutes, 13 points, 4 for 6 from the floor, 3 for 4 from 3, 2 for 2 from the stripe, 6 assists, 3 rebounds, a classic Derek Rose Knicks game, second edition, if there ever was one. The shooting was great from the start, but his ability at 34 to get to his spots on the court, and it's not the same way he used to do it, right? Like early in his career, he would stare someone down and say, I am stronger than you. I am faster than you. I am better at basketball than you. I'm getting I'm getting straight to the rim and dunking in your face. And 13, 14 years later, a million injuries later, he, he just he's d- developed just this hypnotic handle and this understanding of how to dictate coverage to him and say, all right, I'm going to go between my legs. I'm going to cross over. I'm going to hesitate. You're going to back up a little when I hesitate. And then I'm just going to rise up real quick from the elbow and nail a pull up shot. This is a guy who is who is simply not a three point shooter early in his career, has one of the smoothest like just catch and, and, and grab and, and, and fire three point shots in the entire NBA at this point. It, it's it's just amazing the guy he's become and I'll, I'll never not appreciate it again i want to continue to see it against better competition because this, this felt like a game like like the varsity playing the jv essentially but his combination of scoring of shot making and his ability and, and just cognizance of how to make emmanuel quickly and ob top and comfortable and get everyone in the second unit rolling was beautiful to behold in this game alex and i think it portends good things to come for this bench unit yeah and you know it's it when you're bringing up appreciating what he's been able to do in his career, as far as evolving his game, I was kind of thinking about it and he's had sort of like a, you know, obviously all very different players at their primes, but he's had sort of a similar career arc to like a Jason Kidd or like a Vince Carter, except for unlike Kidd or Carter who added the three point shot as just sort of a way to mitigate the fact that like a lot of their other things that made them great were leaving them. At that point in their career, like their athleticism, their ability to break down a defense, you know, whatever. And, you know, Vince Carter obviously played into his 40s and Kidd played into his late 30s, you know, in their last like three, four seasons were just them essentially being three point gunners, uh, which obviously we saw the the finality of of Kidd's career on the Knicks. But with Rose, I I appreciate that he made this adjustment to his, his game at a point in his career where his athleticism is still there and he's still... You know, in, just in a different way. Like, he's still lightning quick when he needs to be. Uh, he can still break down a defense. He can still do a lot of the things that he used to do when he was younger, if not as much a, of a bull in a china shop, so much as like a, uh, I don't know what the animal reference would be. He's like, whatever, some sort of, like a fox, maybe. I don't know, working his way around the china, not breaking any of it, but still being effective, you know? Um but like adding that three point shot while still having all the rest of his skills just makes him such a useful player that can absolutely erupt. Like in this game, you know, again, the, the stats jump off the page in 16 minutes, he scores 13 points, hits three threes, has six assists in 16 minutes. I mean, that's, that's so many points generated in such a short amount of time, just because he comes out there, he's willing to push the pace. He's, you know, willing to accept not having the ball in his hands. Like I loved, 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 loved his and quickly's dynamic in this game where it seemed like quickly was more often the like quote unquote point guard on the floor, but Rose was always there to sort of be the bailout option, whether that was to receive a, you know, a a spot up three or whether it was to, you know, create something for the rest of the team, whatever the case may be, like he just played the role perfectly. And I think I also sort of, give Tibbs some credit for showing restraint and 
you know, even in a game where Rose was playing this well, playing him like 16 minutes, I, I think that's going to be a perfect minute allotment for him. He might not score 13 points in 16 minutes every night and have six assists to go with it, but he's going to positively impact the game while he's out there. But it, I think this game proved like you can also have Emmanuel quickly out there for almost 30 minutes and he's going to also really positively affect the game too and gives you a little more upward trajectory than you know a, a rose at this stage in his career does but uh, just great game all around for Derek Rose huge round of applause for him because I thought that he he was a large part of this team sort of breaking away in like the end of first you know second quarter and really turned this into a blowout and then also the Pistons went on a little mini run in the third quarter and Rose and uh uh, Rose and and quickly and all those guys came back in and sort of stabilized everything and and you know made things work. But um, anyway, I I want to move to Jalen Brunson now though too. While we're talking about point guards that have been doing great things to keep this team you know really running like a well oiled machine so far. Six assists, well, seventeen points also, which is great. But six assists for Brunson in this game. No turnovers so far. Pretty interesting storyline to keep a keep track of here, Gavin. How many assists will Jalen Brunson accrue before he notches his first turnover this season? Currently at fifteen to nothing. Sounds like a good uh, good prize picks bet if you can uh, if you can fit that in. Um, but yeah, he was. He, I, I'm I'm with you. His passing is what stood out to me. Um, I, I love through two games. Him and Julius are are kind of the starter version of IQ and Obi. In that Julius is running the floor inevitably having a smaller player running with him because most bigs just can't keep up with him. He gets a seal and Brunson is throwing these perfectly weighted outlets to him. And, and last game, Julius got a layup off of it. This game, he drew a foul off of it. Uh, it just, it, it's, it's, I love that uh, JB's looking that direction. And I love that Randall's running the floor like that. So those two have really nice chemistry. Obi missed the shot, but Brunson had just a sick uh, against the grain, like cross court, offhand like lefty whip or I guess he is a lefty so uh, so on hand but lefty whip pass to Obi for like a opposite in three that was just beautiful uh and then the move of the game from him was he he was being guarded by Jaden Ivey and it, it was kind of the classic like all right I, at some point in his career this dude's probably gonna dunk on me so I'm gonna make him look really bad while I still can uh crossover uh like which had JB or not JB had Ivy stumbling then went behind the back and then scooped up the ball as if he was going to fire from the elbow. Ivy jumped at him. Brunson just one step to the rim layup. And, and it, it was kind of cool because I saw Luka Doncic do a very similar move recently. And, and those two are so crafty. And it, I mean, obviously Luka is like a different level of threat because he's nine inches taller and, and probably weighs twice as much. Um, but it, it, I just want, I would love to like get to talk to Jalen and just ask like, all right, how much, did you steal from Luca and how much did Luca steal from you? Because those two guys are, I mean, two, two of the only players in the league who, who just have the footwork to pull up those types of plays consistently. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that he's, he's just a fantastic player to watch. I, I, I've found it to be such a treat having Brunson on this team to this point. Um, and honestly, a treat so far has been Julius Randle so far this season as well. Also came in with no turnovers in this game, although he had no assists as well. I don't think that was really a knock on him. Just none really presented themselves. We already sort of talked about how he's running in transition and everything. Gavin, I think we should also acknowledge his three-point shot diet has gotten so much better in these first few games. Like, he's not taking any of the the whack, like, step-back contested shots that he was taking last year. It seems like he's really letting that part of the game come to him, and I, I thought he was really well-rewarded in this game with uh, two of three three pointers made. And to this point in the season, he is at three pointers made four of nine, which I will take all day as far as, you know, Julius is a uh, three point output. I think you would take that for pretty much anybody. So if he can hold this up, uh, I'm loving what I'm seeing from him from that perspective. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of rote for him at this point because the game honestly looks easy for him so far this year where he gets a mismatch, attacks it, draws a double team and kicks it out. And it, it's that simple. And, he, and he's willing to do it again and again and again. I already mentioned him running the floor once for the basket from RJ, once from the basket for Brunson. Um, 
he is doing a nice job just attacking. And even when he doesn't get to the rim, getting closer shots than what he did last year, you noted like the movie had on Brandon Clark last game, this game, it was going at Sadiq Bay and just hitting a little runner. That was five feet away from the rim. There was still like, there was one or two shots I'd want back from him where, where he took um, a long mid range that was contested early in the shot clock. But you know what? Uh, it, it takes time to completely change who you are as a player and bad habits are going to creep in right now. He's, he's playing as smart basketball as anyone not named Jalen Brunson on the roster. And uh, he's, he's a really good player when he does that. So I, not much more to say than that. He's, he's awesome. Yeah, I'm with you. And I think that's uh, I think that's a good note to end on. We've covered pretty much all the bases of this game. So great home opener. Great, uh, great way to start the Knicks season off on the Madison Square Garden floor. And uh, looking forward to more to come. But we'll have you covered for all those and everything else in between on Locked on Knicks. Thank you all for listening. And we'll talk to you all soon. Peace out.